I don't know where to begin, but then again it might not matter, because I don't suppose any of you will believe me. And, from the looks of things, I won't be around to find out how my tale is received anyway. I'm a travel journalist, currently based in Munich, though originally from the UK. When I first moved to Munich, I planned to stay there for a few months trying to secure positions with some European newspapers. But the well-paying journalism position which I secured meant that I ended up staying there for a few years, buying a studio flat near the city centre. I had a lot of German friends in the city, so although I didn't speak German myself, well, very, very basic German, I was able to get by without feeling isolated or lonely. Now I was used to the editor's office sending me overseas. Australia, Japan, Mexico, I loved to escape the normality of Europe. So when they told me they were keeping me in Germany, just sending me west a little, I couldn't help but feel disappointed. I asked where I was going. They said they wanted an article on the Black Forest, Schwarzwald named after the dense darkness created by its pine trees the black forest is an alpine mountain range in southwestern germany stretching west into the rhine river and south into the foothills of the alps it is the largest nature preserve in the country but my boss told me the true angle they wanted me to work wasn't just the natural beauty it was the haunting atmosphere the forest is something of a supernatural spot in Germany, the setting for many ghost stories and grim tales. They wanted an article analysing the gothic mood of the place, which they could print in time for Halloween. My initial disappointment about the assignment gave way to intrigue. I was always a bit of a horror nut, and visiting a creepy spot like this was just my kind of thing. As the trip grew closer, I became more and more excited, doing my own research on the folklore behind the forest and the amazing natural vistas which could be surveyed there. I was flown to Baden-Baden, one of the largest towns within the forest. Although my hotel was five-star, gourmet restaurant, pool and spa, I honestly didn't really like the town. It was swarming with tourists and the whole place had a very commercial air. I was eager to reach the authentic heart of the Black Forest. Next, I rented a car for my two-hour drive, one eye on the wheel, one out the window, taking in the gorgeous scenery, to the tiny village of Gutak. Here, I could see a true traditional lifestyle on display, a heavily agricultural, almost medieval air almost directly in the forest centre. Only here did I realise how refreshing it was to get away from the city. Still, an agitating little voice at the back of my mind piped up. There's nobody around for hundreds of miles. No cell service. No police. Nothing to help you if something goes wrong. And, as it turned out, something did. The final stage of my journey was another slightly shorter drive this one to my final destination i had to be careful navigating these roads they weren't paved at all covered in thick snow or layers of ice and more often than not they ran alongside dizzyingly high ravines for the first 45 minutes i would see the occasional cabin or simple cottage in the valleys below me even a large ski resort once it amazed me that people were willing to take such extensive measures for a little peace and quiet on their holiday. The area, although isolated, was a pretty popular hiking route, and a few hospitality businesses had jumped onto the untapped gold mine of weary travellers. But eventually, I began to see no more buildings, just trees, huge pines, clustered and peering into my car. I noticed almost instantly that the forest deserved its name. 
In the most densely populated areas, a sort of artificial night was created by the branches. That unshakable feeling of being completely alone was a strong one now. I shoved it to the back of my mind. And I had arrived. I rounded a corner, and there it was. The cabin lay in the centre of a large clearing, covered in a carpet of crisp white snow. It was as if, for a moment, the pine trees had subsided from their relentless attack and had left just a small circle of peaceful space. It was beautiful. The frost glittered in the winter sun, and behind the cabin roof three mountain crags sprawled across the sky. The cabin itself was wonderfully quaint, walls made of whole pine logs in the traditional style of the region. Two floors with a patio surrounding it and a simple thatched roof. I parked my car next to the house and unlocked the front door. Before even getting my luggage out, I ran through the cabin like a small child, giddy with excitement. The interior was as pretty as the exterior, hand-carved furniture, a wood fire, cosy little rooms. A lounge, a small kitchen, a supply closet, upstairs, two bedrooms, a bathroom and a study. All through the building was the thick smell of pine. I began to unpack, and it took a few hours. I was planning to be there for two months, with drives back up to Gutach every two weeks for necessities. I had brought every kind of tool I might possibly need for any circumstance, plus a spare for each. I had even purchased two extra tires to go with my car, which I rolled, after some effort, out of the trunk. By the time I had finished unpacking, the sun had begun to set. I wasn't going to start work on the article on the first day. In fact, I planned to spend the first three or four days relaxing and taking in the overall atmosphere before I started any work. There was no service here, and no television so I had to content myself with reading a book by firelight on that first evening. You've never experienced true darkness unless you have seen nighttime in a wild place. No lamps outside, no streetlights, nothing but the faraway moon to illuminate the clearing around the cabin. I dozed off on the couch, staring at that waxy moon through the window. I awoke in the mid-morning, after cooking myself breakfast on the gas stove, I got dressed into my heavy winter gear. I would take a long walk, bringing lunch with me, before returning in the late afternoon. I had been warned not to stay out after dark. As I stepped outside, I was hit by something strange. There was no bird song. During my preparatory research, I had learned about several species of bird common in the Black Forest, and yet, not the slightest chirp. I found the silence unsettling. I hummed to myself to keep it away. As I broke the tree line which ringed the clearing, and continued onwards, I watched over my shoulder as the sun's bright light grew smaller and smaller, the miniature cabin framed in front of it. Of course, that's not to say that it was pitch black among the pines, but there was a discernible dimness. I trotted onwards eagerly. I had hoped to spot a fox or some deer, maybe even a lynx. The fauna was one of the main focuses of my visit. But I didn't see a single sign of animal life, not even a startled grouse or a darting shrew. There weren't even any insects for me to hear no buzzing of ticks or humming of crickets. But I did not let myself get too disturbed by this. After all, I was traipsing around pretty loudly, probably scaring away most things. And the flora left nothing to be desired. Blood-red berry bushes and rich green ferns were enough for my eyes to feast on. Despite the oddities about my surroundings, it really was great to be in the middle of such pure, natural wonder. I stopped for lunch, resting on a fallen log, then continued. I kept checking my watch, first every so often, but slowly, more frequently, counting down to the time when I would have to turn around. 
In fact, it was just as I was turning to make my way back when I saw it. Something black poking out from a snowdrift slightly downhill from me. I struggled forward, curiosity getting the better of me, careful not to tumble amidst the large pile of loose snow. As I got closer, I could make out what my peculiar sighting was. A pair of hiking boots. Nothing else. Just two adult hiking boots, one left foot, one right foot, spaced a few centimetres apart, upright, like an invisible person was standing in them. A chill washed over me. There was something very wrong about this. For starters, what hiker would have just left their boots in the snow? I couldn't see any realistic circumstance in which someone would feel no other choice but to abandon their hiking boots in the forest. And secondly, even if they had a good reason, they were in mortal danger, wandering around with only a few hours of daylight left on a frozen mountain, without boots. I racked my brains for any possible explanation for this. I hadn't seen or heard another living soul during my walk. And besides, there were no footprints in the snow around me apart from my own. These boots had been here for at least a day. I calmed myself, trying to rationalize the situation. There was no real way of telling how old these boots were, how long they had sat here. However they got to be here, it wasn't my problem. Quashing my sense of unease, I turned away and headed home. The next morning, I repeated the same routine although this time I walked in a different direction than I had the day before. Wandering through the towering pines, there were once again no signs of animal life, but I was still able to tap into the same peaceful feeling which the forest seemed to ooze. Then it happened again. I did a double take, brain frantically trying to assign meaning to the blurry shape which my eyes had glanced over. Another pair of boots. For a split second, I thought that I might have somehow walked in a circle and come back to the same spot as yesterday. That was how strong the eerie sense of déjà vu was. But no, they were clearly different boots, a different brand. These ones were sitting, half hidden, just behind a holly bush. Same position and condition as the first. Now... The creeping apprehension of the first encounter had become real bewilderment. What earthly reason could there be for these abandoned hiking boots, in the middle of an abandoned forest trail? But I didn't feel threatened exactly. Not yet, anyway. It seems stupid now, but I pressed on. The fear flared up again when I saw the third pair, even more at the fourth. But as the fifth and sixth passed by, I began to calm down, the tension lessening. I learned to spot them. It became a kind of habit as I walked. Sometimes I would see them in groups of twos or threes, each pair spaced a few meters apart from each other. Overall, I must have found at least fifty pairs of boots scattered across the mountain. The scale of it somehow made it easier to take in. Surely, there was no way that this could be anything but a very elaborate, very bizarre joke. The last ones I found were the worst. Four pairs, standing below a small outcrop. Two adults and two children. From the size of them, the owners couldn't have been more than five years old. Seeing those tiny children's Wellington boots sitting there made my blood run cold, like again, like it had the very first time. All of a sudden I became all too aware of the howling winter wind, and I shuddered as I gazed at this family of footwear. I lifted my head from them, longing for my fireplace and my book. Then I caught sight of the tree. It was by far the largest pine I had come across on my travels through the Black Forest. And that was saying a lot. It was closer in size to a man-made tower than to a tree. For a moment, I forgot about my disturbing finds. Totally in awe. Quickly, I raised my camera and took a few snapshots. I drew closer, 
and the tree completely dwarfed me. Staring upwards, my eyes became lost in a kaleidoscope of branches. The bark was very weathered. Clearly this was an ancient thing. But as I inspected, I realized that there were scratches and cuts made in its surface. Deliberate markings, though I could not discern any words from them. I circled around the great trunk. Yes, there were clear notches in the bark, and here and there small shapes drawn, almost like runes. On closer inspection, I could pick out objects hanging in the branches above me, little tokens, trinkets, ornaments even, hard to make out, hanging from the twigs. In fact, when I listened carefully, I could hear the sound of chimes in the wind. Clearly this was some kind of cultural spot, known to either the locals or the passing hikers. It was a perfect centerpiece for my article. I took more snapshots of the tree and the symbols engraved on it. Suddenly, I was staring at a much larger piece of engravement. There were words etched into the wood, scrawled in large print. I could easily recognize it as modern German. But with my very limited conversational grasp of the language, there was no way for me to decipher it. I took several pictures of the etching, hoping to translate it at a later date. Der Fleischweber kommt. Du kannst ihm nicht entkommen. Der große Schatten kommt. Er wird dich um den Tod betteln lassen. Encircling the writing completely was a ring, made up of strange symbols, three interlocking triangles woven together. I zoomed in on just one of these, planning to research the symbol when I actually had an internet connection. Furthermore, I noticed that a little to the left of me, the ground in front of the tree had ruptured and split, gigantic roots bursting upwards through snow and dirt. Between these roots there were several large holes, varying in size from a bucket to a rabbit burrow. I wondered if any animals did live inside these. I doubted it given my lack of zoological sighting so far. I stopped at each small pit, peering in, examining the contents. When I came to the final hole, I stopped. This one was different from the rest, much larger. It looked almost like the entrance to a cave, it was deep enough that I could not see the bottom. The hole was very, very dark, a pot of thick black ink. It was so dark that it seemed like the darkness leached out of it and spread across the snow, a little aura shadow around the mouth in the ground. The more I stared into that hole, the less I liked it. I can't explain what it was about it, but it frightened me more than the silence or the missing animals, or the boots. I think it was because as I looked at the hole, I felt as if the hole was looking back at me. I felt as if a voice was calling up from the blackness, inviting me to come down. I turned sharply and hurried away, back towards the cabin. I was paranoid all through the long trek back, every so often checking over my shoulder, sure that I would see something but I reached the house without incident. Quickly, I locked the door and went to warm up by the fireplace. That night, I was anxious and restless, tossing over all that I had experienced in my head. Even before the hole, the forest had had an unsettling atmosphere, and although I might have been able to ignore it before, I couldn't now. And the boots. I would have alerted the authorities but couldn't with no service and no police stations for hundreds of miles. Wasn't it strange that I could find so many pairs of abandoned hiking boots, yet not come across a single hiker? I decided that I would stick it out for a few more days. The newspaper was paying very well after all. But any more creepy occurrences, and I was legging it out of there. Something was very, very wrong with the place. At some point during the night, I awoke to a knock at the door. First, I had thought it was an imagining of my half-asleep mind. But as it persisted, I was jolted to attention by a sudden electric burst of fear. 
Who the fuck was knocking on the door of my cabin in the very deepest, least inhabited part of the Black Forest? At 2 a.m., I began to hyperventilate. I didn't want to go down those stairs. Didn't want to open the door. But I knew that if I didn't face what was there, my fear would only grow as my imagination filled in the blanks. As quietly as I could, I creeped over to the window of my bedroom, from which there was a view of the front door. I could see a human figure that at the very least was a relief to my hysterical mind. After taking a few deep breaths, I forced myself to walk down the stairs, every step taken in slow motion. I think I slipped into tunnel vision for a moment as I approached the front door. I undid the latch, but something told me to keep the chain on. I opened the door a crack, stealing myself to meet the late-night visitor. I couldn't help but let out a gasp of horror. The first thing that hit me was his size. The man in front of me had to be at least eight, if not nine feet tall. I couldn't believe that there was a human alive this large. He looked unkept, clothes in tatters, skin covered with a layer of frost. And yet he did not shiver or look the slightest bit affected by the bitter cold. His hair was long, down past his shoulders, matted and greasy and black as the night. I come to his face last because it was the worst part about him. His face was pale, horribly pale. In contrast to his dark hair, clothing and background, it gave the eerie effect of a disembodied head floating in the air above me. Due to his freakish height, he had to bend his neck to even look me in the eyes, he had on a grotesque smile. I find the impression it gave difficult to describe. It was almost dopey, almost half asleep. He looked like he was high or in a trance. He leered down at me with a childish, absent-minded aspect like a toddler. But do not for one second think that his gaze came across as innocent. He stared at me like an infant stares with mild curiosity, a woodloose, before he tears off its legs and squishes it between his fingers. And God, his eyes. They were glazed, glossy, lolling lazily in their sockets. The most unnerving thing about them was the colour, or lack of even. They had no colour, that is, I could find no colour in them. But they weren't black. They weren't colourless. They weren't clear. I can't explain it. It's not something a human mind can explain. All I know is that those eyes made my head swim when I stared into them. We stood face to face, or more accurately, chest to face, for what felt like an eternity. The man said nothing. He just continued to grin at me. All I could hear was my heart pounding thunderously in my chest. My brain was overwhelmed by the thousand questions that it had, all fighting for space at once. I couldn't tear away from those eyes. Suddenly I tried to slam the door shut. His hand caught the door a millisecond before it closed, expression unchanging, never looking away from me. His hand was big, it had to be, with his size, but what truly shocked me was his fingers. They were each longer than the length of his palm, almost as if someone had taken claws and made them into flesh. He pushed the door back open, a little wider this time. Still, we just stood there. I was acutely aware of every minor detail. The distant moaning of the wind, my rapid breaths, his laboured rasping, and, and still he stared with that same awful look. God, why didn't he move? But I knew something he didn't know. The keys, which I kept on the table by the door. Slowly, careful not to let the parts of my body visible move, I reached out for them. Nearly, nearly, yes. I felt the cold metal in my hand. Now I repeated the slow, discreet action, withdrawing the arm. I poised myself, knowing I would only get once chance to strike. Quick as a flash, I jammed the key as hard as I could into his belly, stumbling backwards as I yanked it out. He didn't even cry out. 
but his stare dropped for a second as he instinctively let his guard down, clutching the bloody gash. In a whirlwind of explosive movement, I hurled myself at the door, slamming it shut with enough force that I thought it might shatter. I locked it and collapsed onto the floor behind me, shaking, clutching the key as some sort of futile attempt at a weapon. At any moment I was expecting the door to burst back open to see that horrible smile poke through the cracks, but after half an hour, nothing had happened. Eventually, I plucked up the courage to crawl over to the window. Looking out, I could see the man, a fair way across the clearing, back to me, walking away into the night. Of course, I didn't sleep any more that night. My trip had gone from a frightening feeling to a possibly life-threatening situation. But I've always prided myself on being good in these kinds of moments. That's not to say I don't get scared. I've just always been able to think rationally under pressure. Sure, I could pack my bags and drive as far away as possible as soon as I could. But packing would take a while. Call me stupid, but I wasn't going to abandon my stuff in that godforsaken place. And by the time I was ready to leave, I would have to drive through the night. Out of the question in that kind of terrain. Given that I was going to have to wait until tomorrow morning before I could leave anyway, the journalist in me argued that I might as well devote my time to a worthwhile goal, getting some evidence for what was going on here. I had a strange but sure feeling that the man was still within a few miles of the cabin, somewhere in the forest, and something in me told me that he had something to do with that unnerving tree, with that hole. In my luggage, I had brought a small wildlife camera, the kind used to capture footage of animals in the wild from a remote distance. Looking back, my plan was risky and foolish. I was going to set up the camera in the bushes around that tree, see if I could get some footage of that man. If I did, maybe I could convince the authorities to come out here and investigate whatever shit was going on on the mountain. The camera automatically uploaded the footage to my laptop. Through some wonder of digital programming, it didn't need internet to function. So I didn't even need to retrieve it. I just had to get it out there. In the utility cupboard of the cabin, I found a large axe, the kind used for chopping wood, as big as my leg. I wasn't sure whether it would be effective were I to be attacked, but it sure as hell made me feel more comfortable. Nervously, I stepped out into the snow, axe gripped tightly and the camera in the pocket of my winter coat. My first few steps were tentative, expecting any moment to see that ghastly figure come rushing from the tree line. But the longer he didn't appear, the more confident I grew. I set off the way I had travelled the way before. Although my boot tracks had been covered up by a fresh layer of snow, I remembered pretty well the path I had taken to the tree. Once amongst the pines, my anxiety began to increase again. There were so many places for somebody to hide. But I reassured myself, I didn't care if he wanted to hide in a bush and watch me, as long as he didn't bloody show himself. In truth, if I had heard the slightest crack of a twig, let alone actually seen the man, I would have gone sprinting back to the cabin, abandoning the entire thing, Sensim. I couldn't help but breathe a sigh of relief when I actually reached the tree. Although the eerie air around it quickly dampened my spirits again, I positioned the camera in a fern, well hidden, directly facing that awful hole. I turned it on and started recording. The battery life could last for three days straight. Glad to be done with it, I began to make my hasty way back through the forest, strides growing faster and faster the closer I got back to safety. At first, my brain didn't realize what it was that I could see out of the corner of my eye. My heart dropped, plummeting into the abyss as I identified that nightmarish face peeking at me from behind a tree trunk, half hidden. He appeared to be trying to conceal himself but I could tell from the spine-chilling smile on his face that he didn't really care if I saw him or not. I pretended not to notice, 
using all my strength to carry on walking at the same pace, to not scream and cry like a baby. I felt like a gazelle stalked by a lion. If I ran, he would chase. Another half kilometer, and I had heard no footsteps behind me. I let go of the breath I had been holding. Then I caught him in my peripherals again, this time crouched behind a boulder. It seemed almost ridiculous, such a massive body trying to hide. It wasn't possible. There was no way he could have got ahead of me so fast without making a sound. Yet here he was. I could feel his haunting eyes tracking me, waiting with grotesque glee to see if I would react. I was overcome with horrifying despair. There was nobody to help me. Nobody to hear me scream. Nobody to find my body. I reached the clearing without seeing him again. I knew that he was toying with me, taking a sickening delight out of my paralyzing terror. As soon as I had the cabin locked behind me, I sank to the floor, sobbing like a baby. <clears throat> Any bravery I had mustered before my mission to set up the camera had been evaporated. Amidst the fear, I remember feeling blinding rage. How dare this twisted fuck do this? I spent the rest of the day packing, making sure everything was completely ready for a hasty departure the next morning. As night came, I drew the curtains and pushed bookshelves against the front and back door. I was able to drift into a feverish sleep, hand resting against the axe handle, plagued by horrific dreams about towering creatures with long black hair who smiled like little children. I almost wept from when I woke up in the morning, undisturbed. Before even getting dressed, I hurried downstairs to check the footage. I powered on my laptop, clicked stop recording remotely, and switched to full screen to watch what had been filmed that night. I didn't know what I expected to see, but I knew that I would see something. The footage began with me positioning the camera, nervous face in center shot, then hurrying off screen. I fast-forwarded through the rest of the day. As night fell, the camera switched to night vision, casting the pines in an eerie green glow. I put the footage on five times speed, frantically scanning the scene for any signs of movement, but glancing especially often at that dark pit in the ground. There. No, wait. Go back a bit. There. A hand. I had to slow down the video to make sure I was truly seeing it, a hand emerging from the darkness below, gripping the edge of the hole. I braced myself for what I knew now would be a chilling ride. Another hand joining the first, then a head coming up, a face I knew all too well. The man climbed out of the hole, seeming to pause and sniff the night air. Even though he was alone, I could still make out a trace of that half-asleep smile on his face. He raised himself up to his full, freakish height. Then, disturbing quickly, he bounded out of frame. Once again, I was forced to skip through the film. Once, in the background, among the clustered trees, I thought I saw something impossibly large moving slowly across the screen. But I passed it off as a corruption of the footage. With nothing much else happening and the morning drawing close, I assumed that nothing else had been taped. I was just about to turn it off. I shrieked, jumping up from where I stood. The man's face had dropped down suddenly from above the screen, upside down. It occurred to me later that he must have been waiting right behind the camera. His grotesque visage filled the entire shot, smile wider than ever, otherworldly eyes pulling me in, suffocating me. I switched it off. My own face, reflected in the black screen so suddenly, made me jump again. I entered a cold kind of calmness then. I think my brain just shut off, decided that it couldn't handle any more fear. I quietly got up, got dressed, brought my suitcases outside and got into the car. I put the key in the ignition, felt the engine start, began to roll forward, and the car came to a spluttering stop. I jumped out in anguish, swearing desperately, begging any god I could think of to just let me get away. The back two tires had been slashed, gouging cuts made by some sharp object. 
I was about to lie down and accept my fate when I remembered the two spare tires I had brought. I swore from joy now, uttering obscene curses as I ran to roll the tires outside in a state of pure bliss. In four hours, hampered by the thick snowfall which had begun, I had the fresh tires on. By now it was six sigs in the evening, night was beginning to slither over the sky. But I no longer cared. I would rather drive over the edge of a ravine than face what lurked in the forest. I drove like a madman, skidding on the icy ground as I pulled into the decrepit dirt path. I watched the cabin grow smaller and smaller in the rearview mirror, a sense of overwhelming relief washing over me. After half an hour of driving, the darkness had truly set in, and I kept scanning the road ahead, searching for any looming figures lit up by the headlights. I had the axe on the seat next to me, and the windows rolled up and locked. I felt as safe as it was possible for me to feel at the time inside the car. Wherever the man was, there was no way he could keep up with my life-threatening speeds, and soon I would be outside the range of distance he could realistically be within. Another half hour, and I knew that I could be seeing the first lights of civilization soon, perhaps a small cottage or a cabin like mine. Maybe I could even reach that ski resort I had seen during the trip up. A gigantic shape tumbled from the trees to the left of me, too fast for me to react, slamming with lethal force into the side of the car. Everything flipped and began to spin, forming a nauseating spiral as I could feel myself float upwards from my seat, then a horrendous crack and everything went dark. I came to at some point still to total darkness. The lights in the car had gone out. My first focus was the intense pain in my head, but as that eased a little after a time, I took in my situation. I could see the rearview mirror below my head. The car was upside down. Snow was pooling in through the shattered windows, and there was a savage dent in the windscreen. I was hanging in the air, seatbelt acting as a harness. The axe was a few inches to the side of my jaw, blade completely buried in the seat, a little to the right, and it would have been my face. Adrenaline surged through me as my body kicked into survival mode. I quickly loosened the seatbelt, carefully hoisting myself upright and then down. I patted myself, checking for any severe injury besides cuts and bruises. I was lucky. If I'd had a broken bone, I would almost certainly have died in that car, alone in the cold. Pretty quickly my thoughts turned to the cause of my crash. I remembered a large blur coming hurtling out of the trees. Of course, my first thought was him. But that didn't make any sense. The man was big, but there was no way he could push a moving car down a hill. I decided that what had caused the fall wasn't the number one priority. I had to get out of the forest and fast. Alone and without shelter or food, I had decided to leave my food at the cabin. I hadn't planned on needing it. I would probably perish within a few days. I pulled my road map out of the glove box, and using my compass, I was able to discern roughly which direction I needed to walk. I put my coat over the shards of glass on the ground and managed to crawl through the smashed window without injuring myself. I left everything except the sparsest essentials in the wreck. Yes, even my trusty axe. My way was arduous and slow. I had to squint in the small light my wind-up torch provided, stopping to adjust the map every few minutes. I walked for what must have been hours, never once stopping. Eventually, as the cold and the fatigue set in, I gave up on checking my directions altogether. Just walking, walking, must keep on walking. A few times I felt my eyelids begin to drift together. I had to jolt myself awake. To fall over, to sit down, would be fatal. I would never get back up. Suddenly I heard a sound. It startled me more than I can put into words. Remember, I hadn't heard a single noise apart from those I created myself for a week. I was used to the absolute crushing silence of the Black Forest. To hear it disturbed told me that something was wrong. I whirled around, ears pricked, 
hairs on the back of my neck bristling. There it was again. The sound of leaves crunching under feet. Strangely, given what had happened to me, the man was not a great concern for me in that moment. This was because, whenever I had encountered him, he had been totally silent. It would be odd for him to decide to make noise now. Still, I was absolutely terrified. As the crunching footsteps continued, they sounded as if they were circling around me, and whatever was making them sounded big. I began to back up slowly, body almost paralyzed by fear. I've spoken of fear a lot in this story, and many of you will think you know what I mean. But you don't. You know the fear of seeing an unfamiliar shadow in the corner of your room, then realizing it is your coat rack. You know the fear of encountering a spider in the bathroom. You know the fear of being alone on the train with a stranger. You don't know the kind of fear which I felt in the Black Forest. You don't know total, enveloping, suffocating fear. You don't know fear which clings and melds into your skin like a plastic bag over your head. You don't know electric fear, fear which sets every nerve and sinew alight with agonizing tingles. You don't know fear which rots and festers in the pit of your stomach, drowning you from the inside out with caustic fumes of dread. You don't know fear which takes over your entire mind, letting you see nothing, hear nothing, taste nothing, smell nothing, feel nothing but pure terror. I took about ten paces backwards, stopped sharply and abruptly as my back hit a tree. My eyes were still focused intently on the darkness in front of me, torch zigzagging over the shadows like a rabbit pursued by a hawk. Something at the back of my brain probably noted down that the tree felt unusually thin, but I was too preoccupied to really notice. What I did notice was when the tree moved. I slowly turned around to face it, somehow almost knowing that my very perception of the world was about to change. You see, for all our lives, we are taken up by human things, human life. Human hopes and human fears, hopes about humans and fears about humans. Our mind hasn't evolved to know or care about the others, the twilight world, the things beyond our sight. Things so terrible that they make our petty human worries look meaningless. I stared upwards, seeing something move high up in the canopy of pine branches. I saw a pale white circle begin to emerge from the darkness. That face, that same, awful, smiling face, descended. I began to stumble backwards, tripping, dropping to the ground. I could only watch in horror. It, and he was most definitely an it now, began to take lazy steps forwards, almost as if to show its form off to me. If it had been tall before, it absolutely dwarfed me now, but the growth was not proportionate across its whole body. From the waist up, the man was the same, but his legs. Its legs were about forty feet long. It straightened up from where it had stooped to greet me, revealing its true height. From where I was laying, I had to crane my neck to even see its face. The legs stopped at its hips and ended at its feet, but the in-between looked like they had been stretched on a gigantic rack. They were elongated and spindly. As I watched, I saw tendons twist and convulse within the taut flesh. Whenever it took a step, it looked almost cartoonish in a nightmarish way, raising its knee up, swinging its arms in an exaggerated motion. I was choking, gasping for breath. It began to crouch down again, far too low, lower than its own knees. I could see and hear leg bones cracking and popping, snapping into place to accommodate the position. The legs bent at an unnatural angle in the middle, bending upwards, forming two arches on either side of its torso, like a spider, but with only two legs. I turned and vomited onto the snow next to me. With the transformation complete, the height difference was much smaller. We could look each other in the eyes. Now I could see the creature in all its grotesque glory. What had once been its trousers hang in tatters around its legs. That greasy, long black hair acted like the mane of a wild beast now, the howling winter wind making it flow across its neck and lower back. 
The awful face was unchanged. Same disturbing, dopey look, same hypnotizing eyes. But as I watched, the fixed Cheshire grin began to grow wider and wider, stretching far wider than a human mouth can stretch. The jaw didn't lower or drop down like a python. There seemed to be no adaptation at all to facilitate the stretching more. Indeed, as I looked on, I saw the skin and muscle fibre of its cheeks start to rip and tear open, blood spattering the rest of its face and the icy ground. I imagined that, from the side, it must have looked like some hideous, mutilated version of Pac-Man. The jagged, shredded flaps of cheek gave way, allowing its chin to hit its jugular, revealing its tongue. Actually, I should say tongues. There were four or five, all entwined and tangled together. The slimy appendages were long, like snakes, and they writhed, quivering and bristling, tasting my fear in the night air. One of the things which has stuck with me the most was the fact that its teeth were still rectangular, still human. It would be a truism at this point to describe my fear to you. I looked at the thing. The thing looked at me. It was panting, dribble flooding over its mangled lips and heaving chest. In its awful eyes I could see an unmistakable excitement, an age-old thrill of the chase. And then it sounded its hunting horn. It shrieked. The sound was so loud that I had to cover my ears out of genuine pain. It was a warped, twisted, worse-than-animalistic cry. It sounded like a human scream of agony and the serrated squawk of a bird, all fading off into a rasping croak, then silence. I turned and ran as fast as I could, tripping, running straight through thorn thickets, bashing my head on low-hanging branches. I leapt straight over a small ledge, feeling my ankle twist below me as I continued sprinting. I didn't just ignore the pain. I genuinely didn't feel it. I had unlocked a part of me left over from the prehistoric days, a part designed to outrun true monsters. I pushed my body past what should have been possible. It was like I didn't need to breathe. Looking frantically over my shoulder, I saw it coming after me, head whipped back in the wind almost as if it was laughing. The spider-like form it had morphed itself into gave it unnatural speed, allowing it to scuttle after me, torso leaning forward, horribly long fingers outstretched, ready to yank me up and devour me. I felt the earth-shaking thump and the colossal shower of snow as it jumped. Another look back and I saw it, feet positioned on two trees, forty feet apart, it used those feet like hands, jumping and swinging from tree to tree, suspending its body in the middle. I put even more of my soul into running. I couldn't bear the thought of being snatched up from above. But a human body is, at the end of the day, human, and I could feel myself begin to slow, feel bile rising in my throat. I tripped more often and found it harder to rise each time. I felt revolting, putrid breath on my back, and in my mind's eye I could see those tongues wrapping around my throat. Suddenly I leapt to the left, rolling downhill. The creature crashed headfirst into the pine in front of it, unable to stop in time. I was up in a flash, fresh energy from my new head start. But deep down, I knew that it was futile. Eventually, that abomination would catch me. I began to pray, not even to escape. I knew that was impossible. I just prayed that once the horror and the chewing and the pain was over, I could sleep. Then I saw the black shape in the distance. The moon lit a ring around it, almost guiding me, showing me the way. I did not let myself hope, didn't want to have it cruelly ripped away. But it was unmistakable. A car, driver side door open. I dove inside, slamming the door shut. Could it be? Yes. Somehow, against all odds, the key was in the ignition. 
I spared a quick thought of solace for the original owner, who by most likely meeting his horrific end had spared me from the same. I rammed the vehicle forward with aggressive force, just as the creature's massive figure crashed down behind me. I span in frantic circles across the slippery ground, finally able to get control and burst forward. I couldn't put the car into top speed, there were too many tree trunks to navigate, but I drove as fast as I could, swerving to avoid the obstacles which came zooming out of the darkness. Looking in the rearview mirror, I could see that the thing had raised itself up to standing again, impossibly long strides keeping worrying pace with car. My heart soared as I reached a bumpy dirt road, letting myself think for the first time that I might, might just get out alive. On the relatively even ground, I switched to full speed and was thrown back into my seat by the sudden burst of momentum. The creature, still walking in the upright position to the rear of me, began to be left behind. Yet it never began to run, always walked, almost leisurely, as if it had all the time in the world. That horrible, exaggerated stride, like a distorted cartoon character. Curse. Its shadow stretched across the road behind me, framed by moonlight, elongated and slender. The shadow looked like a man on stilts. Those nightmarish, forty-foot legs began to fade away into the darkness and the last thing I saw in the rearview mirror was that awful predatory gaze, those dizzying eyes, that chilling too wide smile, still grinning, as if wishing me goodbye. I reached Gutach in the early hours of the morning. As the first rays of sun yawned across the sky, I stopped only to eat, ignoring the questions of the locals, wolfing down the meal they kindly made me. Then I was back on my way, speeding dangerously, not caring, eager to never see another pine tree again. In Baden-Baden, I abandoned the car that had saved me. I couldn't keep driving the car of a missing person, a theory confirmed by the crusted crimson spatters on the dashboard I had noticed after closer inspection. I often still think about that poor soul, who they were how they ended up in the wretched forest. Almost in a daze, I booked myself a flight back to Munich, declining the calls from the newspaper when they learned about my early return home. I chose not to take my evidence to the police, partly because I knew they would not believe me, partly because I wanted to spare them the horror if they did. When I got back to Munich, nothing was the same. I quit my job. I didn't tell anyone what happened to me. I got a friend to translate that writing I found on the tree. The flesh weaver comes. You cannot outrun him. The great shadow is coming. He will make you beg for death. I also researched that symbol, the three interlocking triangles. It is a Valknut, an ancient Germanic pagan symbol, representing the realm of the dead. It's been a month. I don't go outside anymore. My apartment is a mess. I barely eat. I never sleep. Every night, I have the same dream. In it, I see the creature on a nondescript road in a nondescript place, still walking, always walking, coming after me. Eventually, it is so close that all I can see is its shimmering eyes and its jagged smile. Whenever I awake... I feel as though it is still out there somewhere, walking, searching, not stopping until it finds me. Don't ever go to the Black Forest. You're probably wondering why exactly I'm telling you this, and I wouldn't be, but for the past two nights, I've been finding handprints at my windows, hearing knocks on the glass, seeing a pale face outside in the corner of my eye that is gone when I look over at it. I would just dismiss this as something harmless, like neighborhood kids playing pranks or a stalker or a home invader. If it weren't for the fact that my apartment is about 40 feet off the ground, 